Thank you. I'd like to begin by inviting you to share in a responsive reading, which is in your hymnal. It's number 551, Earth Teach Me. And it recalls, as does a lot of this sermon, uh, the poem that Kate read earlier. So thank you for that. I'll read the regular text and you can read the uh, italicized. Earth teach me stillness as the grasses are stilled with light. Earth teach, suffering, Earth teach me caring as parents who secure their young. Earth teach me limitation as the ant which crawls on the ground. Earth teach me regeneration as the seed which rises in the spring. Oops. Sorry about that. Earth teach me to forget myself. As melted snow forgets its life. Earth, teach me patience. Yeah. So, not long ago, a woman came into my office. She was in the thick of a deep depression, and she was wrangling with some significant challenges in her family life. We talked for a long time about everything that was going on, and at some point I asked her, what gets you through? She paused for a long time there in the quiet of my office, and finally she said, patience. I was struck at the time by the spaciousness of her response to the circumstances of life, a level of spaciousness I often find it difficult to muster. Patience emerges from the wisdom that everything changes, that no situation is ever final. Patience is an act of surrender to the way things are. Flexibility of spirit in the face of the very joys and sorrows, stresses and irritations that enter every life. Before I had children, I thought of myself as a patient and easygoing person. It turns out that self-image was a luxury of a less demanding life than the one I currently lead. These days, I have two boys, Ben, who's eight, and Jack, who's five, and Aaliyah, who's six months old. These days, I'm inspired by a phrase that I encountered once in a poem by Adrian Rich. The poem is called, A Wild Patience has brought me thus far. And the truth is, I don't know anything about the rest of the poem. I read it, but really, it's just that title that captivates me. A wild patience has brought me thus far. As I enter more deeply into ministry and learn about everything that people navigate in their lives, the things people have lived through and are living through, and the beauty of the lives to which people aspire, all of us aspire. I wish for all of us the gift of a wild patience. My family moved to the New Hampshire seacoast about five years ago. We were a family of four then, my husband Chris and Ben and Jack. And not longer af lot long after we arrived, we took a trip out to Star Island, which maybe some of you have experienced. Star is one of the Isles of Shoals, about 10 miles off the coast of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. It's a little rock in the middle of the sea with a harbor and some weather buildings and a million birds and an old 19th century hotel. It's a simple, singular, spectacular place and also a Unitarian Universalist conference center. It was a magical time. Chris and I had been invited to be Ministers of the Week for a natural history conference. We stayed in this little stone parsonage on the back of the island, and we led worship in the stone chapel that's at the peak of the island. Out there, we had very little access to electronics. We preached sermons, we wrote out longhand, and the only air conditioning came from the sea breezes that came through the windows in the evening. 
Communal meals were served at 8 a.m., 12.30 p.m., and 6.30 p.m. at long tables in the dining hall. The menu was fixed, and we were summoned to breakfast, lunch, and dinner by the, sign, by the sound of a great bell rung from the front porch of the old hotel. So here's the thing. In our mainland lives, a lot of us have some power to manipulate our circumstances to decide what to have for dinner and when to have it, to adjust the temperature in our homes or our cars to the degree. Out on the island, we had very little of that kind of power. And we were taken up into a larger rhythm, a larger movement not entirely our own. The tide ebbed and flowed. Storms blew in and retreated. You could see the storms coming from so far away. It was amazing. And the sun rose and set in this incredible array of colors. It was a constant flow of one fleeting, distinctive moment after another. A natural flow made plain to us because we were totally immersed in it. Our experience was punctuated at predictable moments, intervals by the meal bell, the human rhythm and the ecological rhythm flowing easily into one another. The beauty of it all was that instead of getting worked up about lack of control, most of us just relaxed. A wave of relief, palpable relief, settled over the band of us as our week at Star progressed. People just seemed to accept what came, leaning into the days as they unfolded, enjoying the changing light on the grasses, the buildings and the, the surrounding sea, migrating outdoors to explore when weather permitted and retreating indoors to read or talk or paint when a storm descended. From the natural world, we learn the art of surrender. We learn that movement and flow are the natural way of things and we learn to make peace with the changeability of life. Several years ago, I was driving down the freeway with Ben, our older son. He was three and a half at the time and from the back seat, he dropped this pearl of wisdom on me. He said, Mommy, things get build it up and knocked down again, and build it up and knocked down again, and build it up and knocked down again, and that's the way it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I looked at him in the rearview mirror and I exhaled. That boy knocks me out sometimes. It's pretty easy wisdom for a child who spends his days building and knocking down block towers or constructing elaborate Duplo structures only to have them swept back into the toy basket at the end of the day. And if we're honest, it's easy wisdom for us too. Those of us who watch the cycles of the seasons or live through the parade of births and deaths of people we cherish. It's easy wisdom because the proof of it is all around us. But it's also hard, because a lot of the time we don't like it. Despite ourselves, most of us cling tightly to a dream of control. Against all logic, we hold out hope that we are the exception to the universal natural law. We believe that if we're good enough people, if we buy just the right equipment, achieve some epic level of spiritual mastery, or find the right romantic partner, we can transcend the ultimate realities of human existence. We can achieve some kind of permanent state of comfort, well-being, and peace. And of course it's not true. In the words of Buddhist teacher Jack Kornfield, there is no enlightened retirement to which we ever finally graduate. We grow and mature, and with luck, we expand our capacity to experience peace and joy and equanimity. We expand our capacity to bring joy and peace and equanimity out into the world as we go through it. But we never achieve a final, permanent happiness. We just don't have that kind of control. That's good news, even if it doesn't sound that way at first. It means that at the very least, we can loosen up when things are hard. It means we can cut ourselves some slack. Sometimes we heap suffering onto sorrow by telling ourselves the story that when we don't feel good, it's because something has gone terribly wrong, that we've done something wrong. We tell ourselves that we should be able to fix the situation so that we no longer experience pain. In patience lies the wisdom that what is simply is 
and that for the time being, it could not be otherwise. And it's not just difficult situations that stoke our impatience, it's also the good things we anticipate, better times that don't come to us as quickly as we'd like. I love this story from um, Nikos Kazantzakis's book, Zorba the Greek. Zorba, the title char character, tells the story of an encounter with a butterfly. He says, I remember one morning when I discovered a cocoon in the bark of a tree, just as the butterfly was making a hole in its case and preparing to come out. I waited a while, but it was too long appear appearing and I became impatient. I bent over it and breathed on it to warm it. I warmed it as quickly, as quickly as I could and the miracle began to happen before my eyes faster than life. The case opened, the butterfly started crawling out and I shall never forget my horror when I saw how its wings were folded back and crumpled. The wretched butterfly tried with its whole trembling body to unfold them. Bending over it, I tried to help 